not using test drivers to develop the car gets you to that level because engineers can get to a very high level and some of them are really good drivers and they really know their stuff outside of the boundaries of what's their like niche um, um, a job. Uh, but on the other side, you do need somebody that you know knows how great looks like, knows what a great feel of the uh, of a really good driving car is, yeah. and need, knows how to how to put that in a in a vehicle. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Off the Record. You love Off the Record because we love Off the Record, and you are an extension of we. No, for real though, every single week I get an email from somebody thanking me for introducing them to Off the Record. They say something like, "Yo, I got I got allegedly busted doing 80 in a 65, and I remember you talking about Off the Record, and I hit them up, and it's golden." It was dismissed, it was reduced. Off the record are clutch players and they are here for you. They help you fight tickets. That's their whole entire role in life. And if you go to offtherecord.com slash TST or you download the Off The Record app and use code TSTPOD, T-S-T-P-O-D, we will save you 10% with all legal services from Off The Record. Off The Record is not a law firm, but what they do is they set you up with a qualified partner attorney in the jurisdiction where you got the ticket. Could be a big ticket, could be a small ticket, but all tickets become big over time because their insurance gets hit, there's legal fees, there's more to it than just pleading guilty and moving on. That's why you need professional help. So go to offtherecord.com slash TST or use code TST10 on the Off The Record app and uh, and that'll get you 10% off. Off The Record will go to court for you. They'll deal with the prosecutor, the judge. You can pretty much clear your mind of it after that, knowing you have qualified legal representation. Again, one more time, offtherecord.com slash TST or code TSTPOD on the Off The Record app. And now let's get to the show. All right, folks, very special one for you today. Uh, my friend, I get to call him that, and uh, very excited to have him in studio. Uh, met this guy when I was test driving the Ramatz Nevera. Uh, he is their test driver, and now that uh, Bugatti and Ramatz are the same company, he's the official test driver for Bugatti as well. Talk about a dream job. Miro Cernovich is in the uh, building, joining us today from Croatia. Uh, we talk about some of the amazing things they've been doing at Ramatz. They talk about some of his uh, his background, and uh, it's a great chat. This is a real car enthusiast right here, talking about vehicle dynamics and all kinds of stuff. Miro is the man, so stick around, because it's the Smoking Tire Podcast. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. It's always a treat. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you make, a, make us a stop on your rounds. Yeah. Last time you were here was like strictly social call. You just wanted a map of where to go drive your rented BMW Z4. Yeah, and I wanted you to sign the the article. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, I have yeah, that yeah. Home. yeah. It was a good piece. Came out. Yeah, well. yeah, really, really good. Thank I you really, very much. I really yeah. liked that car. The Nevera is really cool. Thank it's you. It's a really cool car. They selling a bunch of them? Quite a quite a bit. Yeah, it's it's ramping up. You know, people uh, didn't understand what it is in the beginning. Yeah, and of course, you know this. It's a, a small company from you know Eastern Europe or Central Central Europe selling a two thousand horsepower car. You know people go like, mm, yeah, yeah, let's see how it how it turns out. Yeah. Um, but now you know when we we have been around for a while now, we broke uh, twenty seven world records with the car. Yeah, yeah. In which you were driving for. Am I right? Um, some, some of them. Some of them. Yeah. But weren't a bunch of them broken at the same time? A 23, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, oh, like, one, 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 one acceleration and braking run can Base, basically, cover a lot yes. of them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's... I, was, I was doing the development for, for the records. Um, I didn't want to drive a lot of them uh, just because I would, you know, like to see or I was... I was afraid that if I if I you know do something wrong or whatever, I'm never gonna forget forget oh. myself. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we had uh, Martin join us, and Goran also drove quite a few records. So it was was cool. The one on the Nurburgring was really, really emotionally tense. Yeah. Like, I, didn't, I didn't. When you know. say you you did development driving for yeah. the record car, 
like what did that entail and then why did you hand it off to somebody else was it like you handed it to a Nürburgring specialist was that the thought uh, or? Well, Martin is a racing driver. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm a development driver. Okay. So Thanks very much. I, I appreciate can it. be quick. Just Thank you very it. much. I can be quick on the track, but on the other side, he's a professional racing driver, and he does this every weekend. Mm -hmm. Whilst I do drive on the track every basically every week, but on the other side, I, when I do, I, I ne not necessarily drive 10 tenths. And he's the guy that knows how to extract ten tens and do it, you know, lap after lap after lap. And it was just like, you know, uh, he's he's in it, you know, more than than I am. I know the car inside out, and I know that if I hear something in the car that doesn't feel right or whatever, I'm gonna, you know, bleed off. Whilst he's gonna keep the hammer down, whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> that's also one of the things. Yeah. Uh, but all jokes aside, it was uh, it was a really. Uh, an emotional experience because I've been with the car since you know the the, the time when it first sp spun the wheels um, till the the very um, like production cars and everything and then we come to the Nürburgring and this is something like it's the pinnacle of, of everything you do and the car rolls out and it just you, you cannot help to be like overwhelmed with with emotions yeah because Let's face it; it's a very dan dangerous track. Oh yeah, and it's dangerous in a hatchback. Yeah, forget two thousand horsepower. Exactly. I mean, whenever if people haven't been there, I've yeah. been a couple of times, mm. and everything they say about it is true. Yeah, it's the most fun <laughs> race track in the world. It's the most interesting race track in the world, exactly. and it is by far the most dangerous race track in the world. When you drive it eight tenths. It's cool. Yeah. It's nice. You enjoy it. Yeah. Because it's like, it's the tempo that you would be driving on Angelus Crest if the right. road was closed. Yeah. I mean, imagine no. imagine Angelus Crest one way closed road. Exactly. I mean, it'd be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and That's you what know, we do in video games, by the way. Uh, yeah. We can. And you, and, and you know, you're, you're enjoying yourself. You know, you're, you're not under pressure. You know, you don't want to kill yourself. You just want to be fast. But yeah. when you're driving 10 tenths, you know, you're on the edge. Yeah. You're really on the edge. And there are no. Uh, margins for error. Um, I mean, some of the speeds you're hitting there, like when we were doing the development of the simulator, I was like, yeah, this is a simulator, it's probably wrong. <laughs> you, know, you, you see speeds like 280 coming up to like um, uh, to the mud curve, and you go like, nah, it's probably we're gonna be, you know, below that. Or you see 250, you know, uh, before that, or you, you see some speeds on the on the track, and you're like, nah, it's it's a simulator. You go there and you're you're pretty much there <laughs> yeah, with the speeds, yeah. you know. It's and on the simulator we do use the one uh, which is six degrees of freedom, the massive one that, that tilts and all these things. Uh -huh. um, but nothing can prepare you for the forces that you're going through there. Sure. Um, it's not demanding for the body, but it's it is demanding when you're thinking what the car is going to do and how the suspension is going to cope with it. Yeah. Because you go through a compression, and after that compression, the car has to bounce out, and mm -hmm. then you hit a bump that you were not, you know, counting in. Yeah. And you have to hit the curb. If you don't hit the curb, the, your line is completely wrong. Yeah. And you're going to hit the curb at a certain, you know, it, we were doing the, the tuning of the suspension so the car can hope with, cope with, with as much trouble you, you throw at it. Mm -hmm. The more bumps and stuffs you can, you can go through with, without, you know, disturbing the body, the better because yeah. you know you can use you can you can widen use your line deeper curbing right. and exactly carry more speed and yeah. whatever yeah but on, on the other side like you know breaking to some of these corners it's not as straightforward as you as you think because you cannot be fully on the brakes because you have some bumps or whatever you, you need to use the brake to also steer the car there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's going on mm -hmm. Um, when you're driving eight tenths, everything is nice and, and, and dandy. You're, you're using the lines, everything is cool. But when you go up with speed, you're introducing so much energy into the tires. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, be, you know, it's it's another another game altogether. Why so, did that light just turn on? That's <coughs> never happened before. Well, that's, that's, one, an, that's that an idea. That one light by yeah, itself. it was like an idea. An, an light. idea. <laughs> that one was the idea light. Well, it highlights what he's saying crazy. is true. <clears throat> we just have, we have a ghost in our yeah. light. It's okay. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, the uh, okay, when you have an, an electric car mm -hmm. being pushed to those types of of situations, I mean, it's 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 sort of fairly common knowledge that to this point, 
a really fast Nurburgring lap time in an electric car is not really feasible because all the componentry overheats and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then you guys went out and you ran a 705? 705. 705. 705. Yeah. And then Porsche just last week mm-hmm. uh, released their 707 number. Yeah, and, which, and hat off to that because it's a, it's a massive achievement. In a car, I mean, yeah. with you know no disrespect to what you guys did, half the power. That car's got a, th- I mean, claimed, yeah. who knows what it really is, but they say it's a thousand and change. Hmm. You know, it's just over half of what you guys have. Yeah. Two seconds is not very much on the Nürburgring. That's amazing. Yeah, you have a point there. On the other side, we had quite a, we, we, we discussed it quite a few times. And to be fair, people need to understand what, what goes into it. So... Porsche, of course, and and no, I'm not trying to diminish, of course, their their their, their efforts or whatever. Like we, I I think it's a huge achievement what they've done. They are at home there. Mm. They've been developing cars there for you know years and years. And what went into their car is you know probably hundreds and thousands of laps during development, not in one car, but in like multiple cars that they were using. Different, you know, suspension setups, different torque vectoring setups, different aero setups, different drivers. Um, we basically went there and did it in like I didn't, I think like five industry pool uh, slots. So, of course, we didn't have that kind of a budget. Mm. And on the other side, it's there's no, it's it's a huge risk as, yeah. as well. So every time you go there, like if if you if if you write off a car. It's a huge mess. Like there's, you have a goal that you need to achieve. You need to go there. You need to do that goal with minimum um, uh, da- damage or min- minimum danger. And again, you're playing with fire. Yeah. So um, we we did development of the car until basically the last day. So you know, tweaking stuff, checking if everything is okay, checking that you're not going to have like what's the temperature of the brakes because the brakes are quite quite uh, on the limit there. So we were using quite a lot of region. We were using uh, different brake pads, but just like more durable brake pads for for safety. And on the other side, like when we were sure, okay, we have the ingredients, now we go. It was also a massive um, uh, weight on Martin's shoulders because he, he didn't have like 200 laps before that with the car on the limit. He just did like a couple of laps of development, jumped in the car, went. And of course, like you, you, if you do one lap, if you if you screw it up, you need to change the tires. Yeah. You need to recharge the battery because you want the battery to be 100% full, and of course you want everything to be as cool as possible. So you need to just you know cool down the whole complete car, and you don't have time for that. You have an hour to do the 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 thing that you need to do when the the road is closed. That's it. And we basically went there and used that slot, and that was that was what we achieved. A lot of other companies go to Nurburgring with much bigger budgets. Yeah, uh, well, with they have they'll teams. have a facility yeah. at the track. Yeah, you know, and they and they they not only that they don't achieve their goal, they 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 fail miserably. Some some of them, mm-hmm. like we've heard stories and we've we've seen cars that came there. Yeah, they crashed you know, out. Crashed and whatever. out. Did we did a, you know a lot of laps? So, so Nurburgring is is really not a game at all. Like you can go to uh, Laguna Seca or you can go to Nurburgring GP track or whatever. And you can do numbers of laps there, and you can like really, really precisely, you know, time your 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 development. Yeah. Nurburgring, not so much. Yeah. Like we had a situation, we were doing the development, and the guys need to, you know, change the tires, change the brakes, all these things. And I go to to have lunch in uh, in Adenau, which is a village halfway through the track, and they call me like, "Are you coming?" I was like, "Why? Like we need to go to the track, dude. It's." pissing rain here like we are sitting in the restaurant yeah. rain is falling like this and they send me like a picture it's it's, it's summer sunny. where they are <laughs> yeah. so you can have yeah. like four seasons yeah. through the track so yeah. time is is like weather is 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 screwing with you so it's, yeah. it's changing constantly so i've you done never that as have... a tourist lap exactly like, we're at halfway through it's it's crazy i've like I was terrified yeah. in a, like a Renault hatchback. Yeah. Because it's just great, 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 great hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> like it was fucking crazy. Exactly. Like, yeah. So cool. Yeah. 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 It's wild that that's, that that's a condition that can yeah. exist on so that there's track. There's quite, quite a lot of factors you cannot influence at. Right. And this makes it even, even worse. I mean, yeah. 
Well, which is so expensive to do yeah. e- to do anything. And there. season starts what like think late like in May or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Before that, like people do go testing there, but there's like no, no. Yeah. The, the tires that you use, of course, you you try to use like a you're, you're not using you're using a little bit more performance tires which don't work under 15 degrees celsius right like you can warm up the tires but if the asphalt is that cold you don't have the grip yeah mm-hmm. and it's not like ah you're sliding a little bit no when you're driving <laughs> at that level like every millimeter counts yeah. like e- each time the, the the conditions change you have to adapt to this yeah were they running the um the standard tire on that car we were the, running the, the street legal, the, the, the Cup 2. The R2. Cup 2s, yeah. 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 But R2. most people are getting um, like P- what, PS, like PS4S, PS4S right? Yeah, yeah. That's what's one of the more amazing things about yeah. that car is the yeah. level of performance that's available with a, a regular, you know, pretty mm-hmm. much off-the-rack tire. You mm-hmm. don't need the Cup 2. That's, yeah. that's I mean, that, was, that was very intentional because um, when developing that car, we, we set our goal to do a, a hyper GT car. Um, people go like when, when they're buying hypercars or supercars, everybody wants like the, 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 the baddest thing that there is. So, you know, give me the RS version with yeah, the yeah. YSAC pack or whatever. And they end up not driving those cars because they are, you know, n- not that pleasant driving on the road. You do a hundred miles in that car, you, you go out and you're not gonna, you're not gonna say, but your, your, your back is, you know, yeah. is, is aching. And next time you, you get to, to, to your cars and, you know, m- most of these guys have multiple cars. We want you to choose our car. Like we want you to, to enjoy this car, to jump in the car, do, I uh, you know, uh, four, five, 800 lo- uh, kilometers in a, or, or, or miles in a day with this car, just going from one supercharger to another, enjoy the car and feel comfortable in it. So the car is very comfortable to drive. It's, it has soft suspension, which is not crashy at all. So you can, you know, you, you can be comfortable in the car. Has a lot of very cre- clever technology that, that allows you to exploit the limits of the tires and, and, and the road as well when you have the chance to do this. But also imagine you're, you're giving 2.5 mil for the car it starts raining and you need to, you know, stop on the side of the road because otherwise you're going to crash because your tires are super yeah. sticky, some com- compound that you can basically not exploit. So these are normal road going tires on so Michelin PS4S, which are really good in the rain, really yeah, they good are. In, in like a wide range of temperature. And we basically wanted to make the car as usable as possible. Is there, it's a challenge though. And I, I talked to you about this when we were driving together, and I've talked to you about it multiple times yeah. since. Isn't it hard though with electric cars to 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 make them exciting at pedestrian oh, yeah. speeds? You oh, know, yeah. definitely. That's why I kind of like my old cars because my yeah. 1986 Ferrari is exciting at 40 miles an hour, mm. um, and I don't need to go crazy crazy speeds. But yeah. but in the um, in the Nevera, and it's not the car's fault it's just the net it's just how electricity works yeah you know it's not it's comfortable to cruise around mm. in and that's a virtue but it's also if you're not going crazy fast then you kind of go this is a little too normal yeah i mean i think that a lot of manufacturers not only of electric cars but cars in general today are struggling with this mm. and that's a whole you know, new can of worms and a big, big topic to, to go through. And I went through it a little bit with Chris and also a little bit sure. with you. Um, and it's a little bit difficult for my side to talk about it because I'm very biased. Um, not using test drivers to develop the car gets you to that level because engineers can get to a very high level and some of them are really good drivers and they really know their stuff outside of the boundaries of what's their like niche um, um, a job. Uh, but on the other side, you do need somebody that you know knows how great looks like, knows what a great feel of the uh, of a really good driving car is yeah. and need, knows how to how to put that in a in a vehicle. There's there's start, companies are starting to make attempts at building engagement. Like next week, I'm going, not next week, uh, two, three weeks, I'm going up to Laguna Seca to drive the Hyundai Ionic 5N, mm-hmm. which has simulated yeah. gears. Um, <laughs> I just tried the Porsche, um, the, the the e-performance, the race car, the electric race car they built, mm-hmm. which has, you'd appreciate this, it's fucking cool, which has when you left foot brake, mm-hmm. 
rather than doing a traditional left foot brake, it decouples the front drive and overdrives the rear. So it's an oversteer pedal. Oh. So it has a handbrake, so you can in- initiate oversteer under braking, okay. and it has a pedal that you can initiate oversteer under power, which is, as long as you're on a loose surface, yeah. is great. On the yeah. street, it doesn't do a whole lot for yeah, you. Yeah, but it's it's a cool exercise. It's, it's you know, to, for, also for engineers to, 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 to see what they can do with that kind of system. Right, like how yeah. do we add more ways to control the car that would yeah. not be available with a gasoline car. It's a very slippery turf because... Hey kids, gotta take one quick break because we are brought to you today by GiveMeTheVin.com. You know, a lot of times folks are talking about uh, how to sell you a car. What about if you want to get rid of a car? GiveMeTheVin.com is the quickest and easiest way to do it. It could be your old pickup truck, it could be a boring ass Camry, or it could be a Lambo. Whatever it is, if you want it gone for the right price and fast, GiveMeTheVin.com slash smoking time is the place to do it. Use that code or that tag at the end of the URL so they know that we sent you like a good advertiser and a good listener. You feel me? But there's the, of course, there's the auction sites. You know, if you want to really photograph your car, document it, you know, if it's a true enthusiast special, I understand. They're great. But so many of you also have regular cars or so many of you want to sell your car. You need that cash fast. Don't go to CarMax. Don't go to Carvana or any of those other big lots. Give me the VIN.com. You can deliver the car to them or they'll come get it from you. Give me the VIN.com slash smoking tire is the way to do it. They've, they'll give you the best price for your car and fast. And thank you to give me the VIN.com slash smoking tire for supporting today's podcast. Let's get back to the show. Um, you mentioned well, the you know the Hyundai with uh, Ionic Five and and whatnot. So imagine this. So from the driver's perspective, or from hardcore driving crew, let's say you know, the guys that drove a lot of like old school cars and stuff like that, like hardcore drivers, they would just have the puristic driving experience. Period. That's mm-hmm. it. How do you market that? How do you explain to to um, a customer who is basically like a 20-year-old kid, you know, this car drives really good. On the other side, if you show him a video where, you know, you're shifting gears on an electric car where there's some noise mm-hmm. happening and you have a drift mode and you can do all these, you know, gamification things and stuff like that, they get hooked up. I don't personally, I'm not a big fan of that, but on the other side, you know, that's a that's a thing that you need to use, you need to incorporate into the, into the product. So why don't you like it? Um, just because I like the, the raw, honest things. You know, when we were doing some some stuff on the Nevera, we, we had huge possibilities what to do with, um, let's say, the drift mode or with the, with the steering tuning. So when we were tuning the steering, there's like a bunch of options you can do. Like with an electric power servo or electric power se- steering, there's a lot of options that you can put in from like um, you have the, the, the side wind, um, uh, a system that can that can detect the side wind and oh, then counteract. Oh. Counteract. You have the the, return, the returnability function. You have the friction compensation functions and all these things. And I was like, when we started with that, I was like, okay, leave that aside. Let's just do the raw map. And if raw map is not okay, we're gonna try these things. We're gonna try them, but not necessarily leave them in the system mm-hmm. because. You want the the direct connection to the car. Yeah. Anything that's artificial, you you tend to move away from it. You don't like it because this is how your body works. This is how your body reacts. So you, you have your your you know your, your your brain functions in a in a way that you you cannot trick your brain in some some stuff. This is why quite a few cars feel artificial. Like some of the, those cars were trying to utilize torque vectoring to the maximum. Yeah. And then it doesn't feel right. You go into the corner and the car just wants to jump on the, the highest possible lateral force and you know exploit the tire to the maximum was you as a, as a driver you want an analog feel yeah we have we have issues with some <laughs> rear steer systems that feel really really strange 
all of them feel very, very strange. Like um, uh, the Mercedes s- one is the weirdest, I think. Yeah. So it's, I I don't know. I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about yeah. that because I I don't know the the um, the exact car or whatever. But on the other side, whatever I tried so far from four wheel steering systems, I didn't like because in linear range or when you're driving on a normal road, it just feels weird. It gives you uh, two jumps of lateral force uh, uh, development. So when you go into the corner, you give an input to the steering and you have that first one and then you have another one mm-hmm. and then the car loads and then you have the car loaded in the corner. Whilst when you're driving, you don't want that. You want like the steer in the corner, car loads, that's it. On the track, on the other side, four-wheel steering systems work to your benefit a lot. And also, when you're driving around town, if you want to park the car, yeah. if you have a long wheelbase and stuff like that, they are, you know, there's a lot of it that's beneficial. And then there's the, the thing that I'm fighting, you know, make nails through that I don't want that on the car, just because it messes up the car. I, I like that the car is very communicative and that the car is very, um, that, that you are, you, you can follow with the car, you can be on the same the same track. Whatever you do with the car, the, the car is going to react, and it's going to react in the, in the level that you you your inputs are. Did Not, you no go? Variety. Did you guys go back after the raw steering map and put in some of those filters that you were you you encouraged them to leave off initially? We did some just to uh, just to cover the production. Uh, oscillations, let's say. So when you are doing, when you have steering racks and you have 250 steering racks, um, chances are some of them are going to have more friction, some of them are going to have less friction. So you have the the thing that's called returnability function that helps you a little bit that the steering comes to the to the very center. Uh, if you have a very very raw steering map with a very low friction, it's going to be good, and the steering grand, steering is going to come to the to the center. But if you have a little bit of friction, even a little bit is going to just mess you up and then the steering is going to be a little bit sticky. Mm. This is normal and, and you you cannot fight that even through quality control because we are talking about very, very, very small numbers, like like 0.1 newton meter of, of torque that you can basically not feel on your hands if somebody changes it, but you see it on the steering wheel. Mm-hmm. So there are like that these small tricks, but also, that's really like there's a you know like a salty part in the the, the whole system just yeah, to make yeah. it you know good, yeah. just to to be sure that if we if if you know we find ourselves in one of the cars that we don't have to you know change five steering racks until we come to the to the point. Yeah. Because then I'm I'm really nitpicking because you know so you, if you if you tell to the guys in the quality control there you know, zero point you mm-hmm. know zero five newton meters of torque tolerance they're gonna go like are you <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's. It's it's really crazy. It's definitely it's it it also depends on the temperature as you as you go along. So in the summer it's one thing, in the winter it's it's another thing. So yeah, I learned this from from Porsche actually. We were yeah. we, I, I I had commented that one car I drove felt different from another car I drove, mm. and they said that could be the same part. Yeah, you know this car has uh, no. I'm sorry, not Porsche. It was McLaren. McLaren. Mm. I said I said well, just, and they have hydraulic steering. Yes, and yeah. I said this this steering rack feels a little different from yeah. that car, and they and they go, that's just the very well. To this car has five thousand miles on it, and this car has five hundred miles on it, and yeah. and it breaks in over time, and it's mm. it's. We, we are a, talking really <laughs> about small details. Yeah. That, you know, you can pick it up. A couple of guys that are doing it can pick it up because you are like you're, you're the niche guy. Yeah. And some, when some you, of the owners don't even don't even think about this. Well, sure, but yeah. they only get to drive that one car, probably. When you are you when they're when they're <coughs> building the Veras, are you are you being Valentino Balboni and QCing every <laughs> every car? Well, it's not yeah. a lot of cars, right? So you yeah. could, you could drive every car. Mate does. Yeah. Uh, Mate tends to drive every single uh, customer car uh, to, to ensure that, that the cars are you know up to spec. I I'm don't have I'm not. Uh, nearly, nearly enough in, in the company to be able to do that. And also, we have guys that are really, really skilled to do it. So they, they call me if you know if they really find something that they are like on the edge. Should we let this fly or no? And then you know we we sit down and see. But I can say that like the quality control guys are really, really good. Like they are really precise. And, For two and a half million, let's hope and so. They have to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When when you were 
when you were starting at the company, I guess, did you ever have an idea for how the steering should feel that was different from someone on the team? Like you said, you wanted to be raw and only sprinkle mm-hmm. in a little of the seasoning. How did those discussions go where, you, where you, you all landed on the formula you did? Well, happily not a lot of people are so um, um, so in it like I am. Like steering is something like I'm, I'm really, it's it's my you know my pain point. Like if I sit in a car that hasn't that, that has bad steering, I, I I better not drive it. Like I'm almost afraid that I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna it's contagious. I don't want it. <laughs> but you need to you need to go through a lot of like steering tunings, and I did before like b- my previous job. I did quite drive quite a lot of of cars, and I know the philosophy of tuning the steering. Um, there were when when we did it, it was just basically it's. Um, you either like it or you don't like it. That's the first go. And then after, if you, if you find something that you don't like, let's discuss about it. The best steering tuning is the one that you don't have to talk about at all. So if you give the car to somebody, he comes out of the car and doesn't mention the steering at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the best. So that means that it's it's okay. All, not a lot of people are going to spot that you know the steering is very crisp. They're gonna feel that the car is very very good. Because it, it's it, it's combined the the feeling that you have on your hands, the feeling that you get from your lower back, the, the what you see from the car. So it all needs to, to add up. It all needs to come together. Yeah. If it doesn't, if one of those things is is off, that's not okay. So basically, you have three phases. You have the the one when you input the the steering angle, then you have the yaw from the car, and then you have the lateral uh, force uh, uh, build up. Those are the three phases. You can have them very much apart or very close. That will give you the character of the car. But if one of them is off, it's not going to be good. Mm. That's very interesting. Like that's that's a that's a thing that you know. But these are like these are really really niche things where you know you can. Uh, when, when I start talking to this with engineers, they go like they, they put their heads on the side and you see that they are like like not there. But when you when you mention that to another test driver tire developer or, or test driver that develops the car, they really get it. What is, is there an example from your history of a, of a car that really nailed that perfectly? Um, quite a few of them, um, but in a different way. And this is why like people, people ask me often, like, what's your favorite car? I don't have a favorite all rounder. Right, I have right. a favorite so car for certain aspects. Things. Right. Um, one of the cars that, that, marked my my career or gave me a lot that I owe a lot is the the Hachiroko the original oh yeah yeah because that car you can you know you you, you literally knew what what was the manufacturer of the sewer cover that you went over <laughs> <laughs> like you, you can literally feel everything through yeah. your hands right? yeah how about that was you know didn't have the power server at all but that car was doing it in the right way, like, mm-hmm. you know, giving you the right information. Yeah. I think that, that <coughs> clarifies for me what's wrong with the Mercedes uh, four-wheel steering as an example is, like, yeah. the input and the feeling in the seat doesn't match what then is, <coughs> like, there's, like, a delay of half a second, and yeah. then you feel in the seat that the back is suddenly coming yeah. out. And it's, yeah. like, it's un- whereas Porsche's rear steer is, is better where it feels like those things are all happening at the, in the right order at the right cadence. Yeah. So, but that's also um, comes to the difference of uh, you have test drivers and you have racing drivers. These are two different groups. Very rarely do you have uh, a guy that does both things um, at the at the top level. It almost doesn't happen because racing drivers they just care if it's fast. Yeah, they they, yeah. they tend to make the car go fast, whatever it takes. Yeah. And, a development driver wants to, you know, develop a fast car that feels good. Right. It needs to feel good. If right. it doesn't feel good, it's not okay. For a racing driver, if it doesn't feel good, he, he finds a way around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As long as it goes. Is the, num- the lap time lower? Yeah. Like, all right, cool, whatever. And a lot of them do that subconsciously. They, they don't even, they don't even right. notice it. Right, Yeah. yeah. That's, that's it's interesting and, and important. Mm. I mean, particularly for people like us that ultimately – I care more if a car feels good. I'm not. I'm not actually racing anybody. So yeah. what do I give a shit yeah. if the car is this two tenths faster through some section? Mm. I don't care. Um, and 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 I've had a lot of the fastest cars I've driven have not been the most fun. There's crossover mm-hmm. for sure. Mm. I mean, the you know we just put up the video today of the McLaren 750, which man did they make a lot of great decisions in that car. Yeah. That car is fucking fantastic. Mm. Um, but other times it's like, you know, it's not always the same thing. 
Um, Did you drive the original BRZ or the, the mm-hmm. GT86? Yeah, mm-hmm. and we just drove the new one too, the TS. And you drove them on the original tires? Yes. The Prius With tires. The Prius tires. Yeah. Great. But did you drive that same car on high performance tires? Yeah, yes. we just did this. Well, no, no. I, I drove. I drove the first generation BRZ TS, which was same car but yeah. with sticky tires. I think it had PS4s or something. And how did the car feel? It was not as fun. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. it, it just had so too much cornering it, it's, speed. It's the complete package. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you if you miss one of the ingredients, it gets like it's like tuning of the cars. Like the young kids when they jump on the car and they want it like the, the lowest possible right height. <laughs> sure. Do you know what happens to bump steer? No. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> now, you know what happens to damping? Yeah. I just like I have 15 clicks on the dampers. Out of those 15 clicks, probably. There's one that makes a difference. Everything else is just, you know, just clicking. Not nothing happens to yeah. the damper. Unfortunately, that's how the dampers are made, you know, for the market. So it's it comes down to the philosophy of the company, what you want from the product, and how well you manage to keep that that niche, that that line that you want to come up with. So when you're developing the car, and this is, I think, this is quite a big of uh, this is this is the biggest issue with with some manufacturers. They do that line in the beginning, and they don't define it properly. What I mean is, you know, we're going to make this car. It's going to be, I don't know, a successor of our, our model. Okay. If it's a successor, it's even even easier. But if it's a new model, if you don't define it, if you don't say, okay, this is the ID of that person, of that car. It's yeah. going to be such and such. If you don't do it in a proper way, Everybody in the company that has any room is going to do that in their own way. Right. And yeah, you end yeah. up with a car. It's like a person, like a, pe- a person that, that wants to suit everybody. In the end, nobody trusts that guy. Yeah. You know, you, yeah, want, yeah. you want the car to be that. You want it to be the best car for <clears throat> this group of people. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then you can kind of yeah. not, it's not for everybody. Okay. Yeah. 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 The, 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 we just did a thing. We, we were, Lucky enough to get some free racetrack time. Thank you, Spring Mountain. You're very delightful. And uh, and we had the new BRZ uh, mm-hmm. TS, which has better dampers, better brakes, and it has Michelin, uh, you know, high performance tires yeah. on it. At uh, <clears throat> at racetrack <clears throat> pace, you yeah. can get the car loose, yeah. but on the street, you definitely would yeah. would would lose a little something there in exchange for that lap time and that grip. Mm-hmm. With a whole track to work with, like yeah, you can enter a corner too hot and slide it. So, um, but that also brings us back to, to your question, like, how do you make the car fun at 60 and 160 miles yeah. an hour without sliding it? Yeah. You know, you need to, to do certain things. And this is the why, why certain companies, I'm going to try to say this without naming some companies, but you're going to know which one they are. <laughs> so some companies do they do that in, in, on purpose where, you know, every gear shift feels like somebody's, you know, hammering in you in, in, in the back. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. They do that on purpose. They can do it silky smooth. They yeah. don't want to do that. Also, some companies do traction control that will, you know, let the, the car loose a little bit. It will save you. It will never kill you. Yeah. But it will just scare you enough that yeah. you feel, oh, I'm in the limit. Yeah. Well, actually, you're not. You're, like, far away from the limit. But, you know, it makes your adrenaline jump. And for some people, like amateur drivers, it's more than enough for them. And they feel like, you know, they are on the rugged edge. Yeah. And it's okay. It actually saves lives at the end of the day. But, sure. you know, it comes down to the philosophy of the company. You, on the other side, you have some companies that keep the car super safe until it's not. You know, you, you, you never know how far from the limit you are. And this is something you, you want. You need to understand how, how close to the limit you are. Do I have 20%? Do I have 30%? Am I on the limit? What's going to happen? Mm-hmm. And when you cross that limit... You don't jump down, you know, come down to like 15% of the of the grip, but you come down to like 70% yeah. of the grip so you can still play with the car. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a big factor with the like 48-volt um, anti-roll bars. You know, they can make yeah. the car drive totally flat, but if it's too flat in a corner, you're not aware of how much Good point. L- you're leaning on the tire or just yeah. how close you are to the grip limit. Good point. So um, if I put you in a dark room, and put you on a rotating chair and I rotate you, you're not gonna feel, if I do it very smoothly, you're not gonna feel if you're rotating left or right. But if I put you on a, on a, um, on a plank that I'm gonna tilt left or right, you're gonna feel it. Even in the plane, I don't know if, you, if you've noticed this any time, like planes are made to be like, even when the guy is going in the corner, yeah. 
you're not supposed to feel it, but you can see it somehow. Yeah. You can see that the fuselage is like this or like this, it's yeah. tilted and stuff like that. And this is why some, some drivers don't like flying, me included. <laughs> uh, because like in the car, when you have like a, uh, one or two degrees of roll, like something is happening. In a yeah. plane, three, 30 degrees of roll is normal. Like, yeah. It's like, and every time I, I do this, I'm, I chickened out. <laughs> but on the other side, this is what gives the information to, to the, the thalamus part of your brain what's happening and it's feeding that to, to your cerebral cortex or whatever. And this is how you get the information. So if you have a very flat car that doesn't roll at all, it doesn't make it the best driver's car. Yeah. I like you, a little body roll. You need to body have, rolls yeah, good. You need to have enough. Yeah. Not too much, not too little. And also it comes down to, to the speed of, of, of the roll. Yeah. You know, that needs to, to be really, really. But, you know, as cars time. get heavier and heavier, we now have to do more to resist the roll. Yeah. Which which then gets you even closer to that grip 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 gone, gone. you know yeah. sort of thing. The lighter the car, yeah. the more the wider that gray area is between grip and sliding, yeah. and it's more comfortable to play in. Yeah. You know, even if it's a crazy thing like a McLaren or something, mm. because the car's light, it, you do still have quite a lot of room there yeah. compared to to something that's very heavy. And it's hugely complicated to do because. Um, you need to have everybody on the same page in the company from the visionary mm -hmm. in our case mate to the whole management down to the engineers that are developing the car if if it's not happening if it's if it's the other way around if people have other ideas you're gonna end up with a car that's not so good and mm -hmm. it's super 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 slippery turf because the 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 if you if you make let's say that the visionary comes out and says okay i want zero roll on the car and the vehicle dynamics guys go like, it's not okay. We need to have some roll because of this, 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 and that. And no, 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 I want zero roll. And he persists on this. And there's a company that does that. They they made quite a few mistakes with their cars because of it, because the 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 chief was insisting on zero roll. Mm -hmm. And they ended up with cars that you know you, you drive them on the road. They feel super darty and they are they're really good. But then again you start pushing the car, it doesn't feel right mm -hmm. because it just feels like you're driving a board and suddenly it loses grip. And then it's like when it starts a tank slap, it's it's a mess. Yeah. And if you have that in line, you can make a car that is very um, unique and it's, um, how would I say, like homogeneous through the whole range that feels it feels right. Otherwise, the, the, the driving dynamics can be, like the numbers can say, awesome things like really high grip really you know good cornering cornering abilities and all these things but it doesn't drive a car okay. yeah if you're not mm -hmm. a racing driver and you don't know how to drive yeah. around that you're going to end up with a car that doesn't drive so good yeah yeah and this is this is the the basic role of the test driver yeah you know you need to you need to give to the engineers the uh, the the sense of where those numbers fall in are they good or are they not because mm -hmm. a five can be super cool 5.1 too much 5.9 way too little yeah and you need to somehow give them the sense of those numbers and you need the perfect number not the biggest number not the, the lowest number mm. yeah. speaking of numbers i was just looking at the chart of 23 records in a day oh. of all of those numbers up there is there one of those numbers that to you is the most impressive definitely which what is the most impressive number on that board zero to 300 kph which is and why is why is that specifically which was 15.68 is that right no 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 it's 9.2 oh nine oh nine oh nine point two two sorry this is a very small oh that's zero to 300 to zero yeah. is 15.68 so yeah. 9.22 is zero to 300 which is 186 yeah. miles an hour yeah. so why is that i mean obviously that's a ridiculous number but yeah. why is that the most impressive to you the war of numbers as the thing now in the automotive industry always has been yeah always it's always has like, been but it's yeah. people like ours fault by the way we put the big number on the cover of the yeah. magazine it's our fault yeah because we it's, fucked it's it very all difficult up. to describe which car drives better because mm -hmm. this car has better driving dynamics right and because you cannot put the number to you know how good this car feels like other mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have like a zero to ten chart but you cannot right. measure it right there's no like you know measurement for do this uh, well, this is, you know, you can easily clock it. Yeah. Somehow. Um, why 0 to 300? Because 0 to 100 kph is impressive. And we put like 1.74 to one, 60 miles yeah. an hour. Yeah. 
Um, that is very impressive, but you know, you, you have some electric cars these days that are really, really quick off the line. They get to 60 miles an hour and after that, they right. start to bleed off because right. because of the nature of the powertrain, because of the battery, because of a lot of systems. Some of those cars can do it one time. Some of those cars can do it, you know, a couple times in a row. Um, we can do it a lot of times in a row. We can do a lot of launches in a row that are going to be pretty precise and always hitting the mark. But what happens is that you have you're cutting your 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 power with traction control because of the tire, and it's not until about 70, 80 miles an hour that you start completely unleashing the power. And what we do with, with customers when we drive them, like they, they come out and it's like, ah, I drove very quick, you know, electric car of, you know, Taycan, Tesla, whatever. It's like, ah, I know how it, how it is. Okay. And everybody stays, like they, everybody is, is super surprised. Once you reach 120 miles an hour and the car just keeps on going and it does keep on going. Like when we did the, 256 mile an hour run. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to calculate from, from kilometers to, to miles. Um, when we did that, I was shouting out to the guys in the box. I was shouting out the speed every 10 kph. It was literally one second. Like you, you go like, you mm -hmm. know, you're, you're driving like, you know, it's 310, 320, 330, 340, 350, 360. It goes really that quick. And you go like three, 400, 410, it went like four, four, 412. It just happens like this, and you start slowing down. And the other thing, of course, when you're doing that speed is you lose the sense of, of orientation at all. Like yeah. you start to slow down, and you feel like, okay, now I'm at the speed where I can literally open the door, yeah, and you look at the still, speed. Still and still 150 still, miles yeah. an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. how you get to that That's speed. That's how people go off the end of runways. Yeah. Because they're still going like 90, and they think they can just make the corner. Yeah. <laughs> they realize I, I, re I remember we were doing, now that we were doing uh, full battery to, to 0% of charge, uh, uh, 350 kph, which is how the, the, the car is limited on the road. Mm -hmm. So it was a test that we, we had to do. Lap two, I say to the engineer, like, let's let's just uh, let's crack jokes. Let's talk something because I'm going to fall asleep. It's an oval. You're an oval, 350 kph. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, just, you know. It's a circle, so you're not really changing yeah, your you steering don't do anything, very much, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And the way you keep your, your brain busy because everything looks the same, you're looking at the, the horizon. You go like, oh, so at, you know, uh, kilometer two, there's like two towers, two chimneys there. And then there's a bush at 300, uh, kilometer three. And then you're, you're, you're painting a picture in your head just to keep yourself going. Famously, How long did some the battery uh, last? British journalists, they set the cruise control, I think, in a Bentley a long, like 30 years ago on that Nardo ring. And they got in the back seat because they had hit a speed where yeah. the car was naturally like being, you know, gravity was pulling it in, yeah. but it centrifugal was... force was pushing it out. Yeah. And they found the balance and they both got in the back that's seat. That's crazy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I wouldn't do that yeah. ever. But that's how, how, how long did the battery last at 350K? Uh, I think it was around 80 kilometers, 80 or 90 you know, kilometers. It must have, I mean, it couldn't have been that long. That's, you know, it's yeah. only like 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's, it's I mean, great. not that I expect yeah. it to last longer, but that's still. Yeah. So, okay, so re it's really then the differentiator for, for you mm -hmm. is that it's the post 100 mile an hour speed that, yeah. that is yeah. the most important thing. That, that, that gives you... If we are talking about numbers, that definitely in my eyes doesn't make uh, a good car or a bad car. But that just shows you how much power and torque you have. Mm -hmm. Like really powerful cars should be measured in those kinds of numbers. Yeah. And when you look how... Zero like to we, 60 is kind of dumb now. I mean, yeah. particularly because there are some phenomenally fast cars that mm. are not all-wheel drive. Yeah. And it and their zero to three hundred number could be incredible, but their zero to sixty number is not as good as like, yeah. you know, a, a basic ass Tesla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it just doesn't. It's like who cares? It's like old school Detroit thinking. Yeah, and plus, you need to also understand what with these numbers that we are doing, we are pulling one point three g average till hundred till one hundred and thirty kph was it like seventy miles an hour something. Yeah. Like. So that. After you do it like two, three times, if you're not trained, you need some rest for your neck. Yeah. So it's that's ridiculous. Like, I remember you know, doing a couple of a couple of pulls in the yeah. Nevera and feeling mildly ill afterwards. Yeah. I mean that's mm -hmm. your eyes hurt. I bet the zero to four hundred to zero really makes you feel some things. Like <laughs> yeah. your eyes go back and then they get put back in place. But that's <laughs> yeah. What is your what is neck. your braking strategy at four hundred kph? 
Um, with this, it was just a no-brainer. Just jump on the brakes. Just stand on the brakes. Yeah, but you, this was just for the record. But <laughs> when you're doing 412 kph, what you should do is just lean into the brake very yeah. slowly. You yeah. don't want to disrupt the aero. You don't want to disrupt the car. Yeah. You want everything to be super smooth when you're slowing down. Yeah, that's. I mean, you got to be. <sighs> <laughs> just jump on the brakes at 400k. Yeah, unweight you know, the front. Or unweight, yeah, unweight the rears. Yikes. Yeah, that's that's gnarly. Can we go back real? Because I know Matt, you know Miro pretty well, but if you could give the short version of like, how did you end up with this job? I'm sure it's a story you've told a lot, but you know, yeah. you have this this mind that pays attention to steering feel at such a high a high level yeah. and all these other things. And, and so, how did you get here? Um, so I I come from a family that didn't have any automotive. Um, experience or heritage or something like that. So my, my late dad and my, my grandfather and my uncle, they were not in cars. Like they liked bikes and cars and they were quite good drivers, but never into racing or something like that. And this is something I discovered like when I was a kid and, you know, quite a while ago uh, when, you know, you didn't have internet and, you know, steering wheel was freedom. Like you get your, your li driving license and it's like, yeah, yeah. Just, you that go. was me. Yeah. I was gone. Yeah. You, you just, you know, yeah. and it was the, the same thing for me. And I, I started driving at like 12, 13 years of age, like just, you know, playing with the car, trying to understand what the car is going to do, what, what the steering does, how do you drive? And I started uh, building my own car when I was 16, like rebuilding an old uh, Fiat or basically Zasta V850. And my birthday is January 13th, uh, January 13th in the morning, like at seven o'clock, I was in the, in the police department. I got my license and that was it. Like I yeah. was gone. Uh, but from age 14, I would say onwards, um, everybody has their own like um, heroes and, and role models and whatnot. Mine were test drivers. Like for me, yeah, of course I followed rallying and Colin McRae was this big thing. You know, I was looking at this guy, you know, winning championship and, and all these things. But Loris Bikoki, Ken Miles, um, those guys were for me, you know, Andy Wallace as well. They were for me uh, the pinnacle. Like, how do you do that? Like, how do you develop a car? How do you make a car feel good? And what is it like behind that, that job? And Raising, like, uh, be, being a kid in Croatia, they are, like, you have chances like a snowball in hell to, to become a, a test driver for any brand because there is no school for this. Like, there's no school in the world for this. Yeah, it's not... On, on the other side, if you can, if, if you go and, and, and like, if you, if you get your degree as a mechanical engineer, there are some chances with probably, like, at that point, you know, somebody else has been, you know, doing go-kart racing or whatnot and he knows somebody from ferrari or whatever and they get on onto that that job so you don't you don't have the door opening is not there um and i went to uh to college i went to to be a mechanical engineer and the best at, at that point I, I remember there was a, like a survey and like the best jobs for uh for men and I remember automotive journalist was amongst top two. I, I, I'm not sure which one was the second. I, I'm, I'm, I think it was between uh, automotive journalist and, uh, and an astronaut. It was literally that. Wow. So I was like, <laughs> and you know, l watching <laughs> Tiffany Dell and those guys and, and early days of Top Gear and Fifth Gear, and I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. <clears throat> and I was much closer to that than I was to the to become a test driver. Or an astronaut. So, or an astronaut. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't want to be an astronaut, actually. But anyways, um, I got, uh, it was a, a right time with the right people in the right place, and I got to uh, start doing uh, automotive journalism. And you can imagine, like, ideal playground. Like, I'm in my 20s, my early 20s, and I'm, uh, I have another car every week. I get, it was magazine? Yeah. yeah. I get paid for that. I get to drive a lot of cars. I get to, to ex explore with a lot of cars. I get to, to you know travel also and do on like you know press presentations and whatnot. And on top of that, I was uh, I started a Formula student team in Croatia, the first one, 
and we were developing a race car. So I was learning mechanics behind the whole story and giving myself the what, the, the, the why. I'm mm -hmm. in the lectures and watching all these, you know, mathematics and whatnot, because for me it was a pain. Like yeah. A massive HDAD, you're sitting there, it's like, why am I, why, why do I need to know this? Yeah, because you need to pass the test. Yeah, but... But then what? Then what? Yeah. Exactly. And... At that point, like, um, I was in automotive journalism for like 10 years and Mate started the company, started Rimac basically. And I knew Mate from 2003. Uh, we were meeting on, on some you know, like uh, drift days or track days and stuff like that. And I was actually at the track day when the engine in the E30 blew up. I oh, was, which is the one that he turned car. into electric? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was there drifting with my car, so you know, I was at the track, and they were hitting the rev limiter because they were using ridiculously short gear ratio with that car, and the engine blew up. And I came to him and was like, okay, now, like, what kind of an engine are you going to put in? I'm going to put an electric engine in the side. Huh. Okay, I'm going to have a beer, see you. Yeah. Because at that point, like, everybody, like, was doing some projects of their own and, and you know, uh, uh, failing miserably. <laughs> You know, because you don't have the money or, you know, it just, just takes too long to build and whatnot. So passes a couple of years and with Formula Student uh, and uh, Matt doing his thing, we were um, trying to find like machine shops that would do certain things, you know, machine or weld something on the car and stuff like that. So we were exchanging contacts. And one day he called me and says like, okay, I have the, the car running. Do you want to see it? I was like, yeah, sure. So I come to his place and we go for a drive. I will never forget that because it was super sketchy. Like, you know, two seats in the car, no seat belts, a, a bunch of batteries behind, and the car is going like a bat out of hell. Like, yeah. it, was, it was really, really quick. Uh, at that point, I knew, like, okay, he's either going to, you know, be, become an astronaut <laughs> or he's going to fail. And chances are he's going to succeed because, you know, he, was, he just had this mind set for that goal and, like, no compromises. And... At the point where he did, or they did the, the concept one, I did the brochure for that car as a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, it was literally, we were taking pictures of the car in a workshop at like seven o'clock in the morning. At nine, the car left for Frankfurt. And in the evening, we sent the brochures for the, for the unveiling of the car. And that was like, that was the part where I saw like a door for the becoming a test driver slightly open. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I need to jump on this. And uh, Mate was asking or searching for a marketing manager. And since like I was doing journalism, I was like, okay, I can do marketing. But at the point where we start developing the cars, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're I'm there. Going, I'm going there. You're in, you're in the room. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're, yeah, but now you're test driver for Bugatti also. How about yeah, that? Yeah, it's that's a crazy. It's incredible. One. It's it's really, you know, it's um, it doesn't happen. It's not it's not normal. It, I I I find this really. I'm really happy every every time. Every every morning I wake up or I'm going to test. I need to pinch myself and go like, this is what I do. Huh? Yeah, but it's it's a it's a great it's a great example of developing a skill set that will come in handy later, without expecting it to be the thing exactly and then you know putting yourself in uh the position where people who are doing big things will notice you and want your help mm -hmm. and then being ready to do a good job when you're asked yeah and you know and seeing seeing those little open doors mm -hmm. and being the person that that they come to you know when they open at the same time it's super risky and and sketchy because um if you want to become an athlete, you know, there are people that know how to build you in an athlete. Mm -hmm. And you can have uh, uh, genetic skills or not, but, you know, they, there's people that can, you know, do that. If you want to become a desk driver, like, you learn by doing, but it's up to you, not up to the other guys. Right. Mm -hmm. Be thirsty and to really, like, gun for this and, and really try to understand why, why things are in a such a way. I had a chance to learn from the best guys in, in the job, like in the, in the industry. I learned from uh, Sergio Rai, who, who has been a chief test driver for Pirelli uh, since Ferrari F40. Um, and the way I did it is just like, I, I asked him like, can I go for a ride with you? 
I was like, yeah, sure. So I jumped in the car with him. He didn't talk. He didn't show me. He didn't point fingers at some things. He was just driving. It was my job to soak it all up and to understand what he was doing. Same thing with John Claudio Travaglia, the guy that has immense knowledge of vehicle dynamics. Same thing. Like you, you try to pick those things up and you're basically stealing from people, but you're you're painting a picture for your own. And I get why there's not a lot of test drivers because and I feel, you know, I feel very um, possessive of that knowledge. And I'm, I, I would pass it to somebody, but that guy needs to deserve it. He needs to really, really want that that skill and that job because it's not it's it's. It's a it's a very specific skill set. It's not that difficult to know if you are if you if you gun for that if you really want to know it. But people come and they go like, oh, can you show me a couple of tricks and stuff? And I was like, yeah, you know, it's not like you know card tricks that you can show to your friends on the party. You need to develop that with years. Mm-hmm. So it takes a lot of time to to build up to this. Sure. I yeah. mean, I people ask me how to do this job all the time, and I exactly. can even if I tell you, yeah. It's not going to actually help that much. Yeah. You kind of have to figure the rest of it out. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk about Bugatti for just a second? Yes. They've, you're you're test driving the Bolide, and now and you're working with Andy Wallace. So you said, oh, said yeah. this. So it's like you know, for me, it was like I used to read Road and Track. Yeah. And now I write for Road and Track. Yeah. So I feel very lucky that I've been able to like wiggle my way into that. Yeah. And you said you're one of your idols was Andy oh, Wallace, yeah. and now here you are driving the fastest cars in the world mm-hmm. alongside Andy Wallace. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty crazy. It that's is. Even, that's it an is. even smaller group. You're it talking is. about like three people. Yeah. Um, and the Bolide is this new thing. We saw it at Goodwood. It's mm. ridiculous. It looks, it looks really like a cool. video game. Yeah. Um, what is that like to drive? Physical. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it, it is really, really, really quick. Um, we're pulling 2.5 G with this car, so... <laughs> It's it's really really quick. I mean, it's a uh, in in a nutshell. That's a uh, engine from the Chiron and the gearbox from the Chiron uh, on a really uh, capable chassis with you know racing slicks. Um, it's a really really quick car, and you need to be concentrated on what you're doing. But at the same time, if you're an amateur driver, it's a very benign car to drive. In meaning, terms of, if, meaning, if you're trying to just enjoy the car and yeah. not go as fast as it will possibly go, you can yeah. have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Now, the guys really, really did an, an awesome job. I, I'm not allowed to talk a lot about this car, um, but on the other side, it was a huge um, pleasure to develop this car and to, to work with with uh, alongside with Andy on on testing because I mean he's 63 years old. You cannot believe how quick the guy is. I mean, and I can because I've seen him drive. But yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and we talked to Andy briefly at Goodwood, mm. and he he seemed to enjoy driving it very much. He yeah. said it was a ton he, of fun. Yeah, yeah, he he is really enjoying it. I mean, maybe if you're used to driving street Bugattis that mm. are two tons plus, and now you get to sample that powertrain in a yeah. you know a carbon package that's much much lighter. Mm-hmm. Um, is, that's have you, have you ever driven like a DP2 style race car? Like I'm trying to think of like a what, prototype. What would this race equate car? to in terms of a race? Exactly. Car? So the first time I drove this car properly, I did a did a one lap on a, on a drive track, and then I did a drive in Imola in like rain, like Whoa. it was really really wet, and I was genuinely afraid. Like you know, it's. If I bin the car, I will never forget myself. Like it's it's gonna be you know terrible, um, not just I mean, of course not for me, but also for the project. Um, and I was really careful. And then I ended up doing really quick laps with this car, really driving it on the rugged edge, uh, because the car is set up in a way that you know you have all these safety systems with the car, like ESC on the car. You have ABS, and they're really dialed in properly. And you can really enjoy with the car, but it's it's super impressive to see that car. Like visually, it looks the bomb. Yeah, like, it looks real crazy. Really crazy. Yeah. Sounds really crazy. And when you see that car, when you're sitting in, you're really in the tub, and you know, and this the, you're, you're you're enclosed in the seat. The seat is is molded for for you and stuff like that. When you're sitting in the car, you really feel like okay. This is no joke. Like you know, now we are going to 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 drive a really, you know, uh, uh, powerful beast, and then you figure out that a couple of corners, okay, I can play with this thing. I can I can you know, 
fiddle around. I can put it in a slide and, you know, it's not going to kill me. That's really, really cool. Wow. Like, and then on the other side, it's massively quick. Like some of the lap times that we did and some of the speeds that we did with this, this car on some tracks were, you know, right there. Mm -hmm. Really, really, really high. Um, and now Bugatti has just released this uh, V16 engine, which mm -hmm. sounds at least on a... On a on a YouTube clip sounds really cool. Oh, yeah. When I interviewed Mate last year uh, at the Quail, mm -hmm. he hinted at that. He said, we mm -hmm. have this new engine. It's got no turbos. Yeah. It revs really high. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a hybrid system to fill it in. Um, that sounds to me pretty exciting mm -hmm. because it, it actually, uh, it seems like, it could be uh, a, a really not that a, not that a Chiron is not a driver's car, particularly something like the Pure Sport, mm -hmm. but like it actually seems like it's going to push the Bugatti brand into being like even more of a driver's car, really. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's going to be a very impressive car, um, not just in terms of performance, but also in terms of technology that goes inside. Um, it's. Definitely, definitely looks like uh, Bugatti, unmistakably. If you see it from a mile away, you're going to know that it is. But there are things that are implemented into this car that are really, really clever design and clever engineering that will enable high speeds, but also very, very high stability um, in terms of aerodynamics, in terms of weight distribution, in terms of, of course, the powertrain, because it's a hybrid car um, and very powerful you know, hybridization with really, really strong electric motors. So it, you're gonna see it's 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 coming quite soon, and mm -hmm. you're gonna be you're gonna be happy. I hope I get to have a go. If I yeah. suck up to Mate enough, maybe. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we just need yeah. next, you know, next time you're in town, we need to choose a more appropriate route yeah. with more space <laughs> for these 2,000 horsepower cars. Yeah. And to drive the Nevera in Malibu. And I was like, guys. But the noise that car yeah. <laughs> makes, that that engine makes, it's, it's, it's not noise. It's sound. And it's, it sounds motorsport. I and bet. It doesn't sound like a normal... You know, your normal hypercar. Well, the W's, you know, the W16, you know, mm. is an effective powertrain, but it was never the most passionate sounding power to me. Yeah. To me, I'm, I'm sure there's people who think it sounds amazing. Yeah. I didn't, you know, compared to a V12 or, ah, you know, a high yeah. strong, you know, in S54, yeah. BMW or something like that. But mm -hmm. I think the the V16, it, it goes back to, to old school, like, you know, 30s kind of motoring yeah. where like no engine configuration was off the table. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing with, with the Bentley W12. The Bentley W12 never really did anything for me. Mm -hmm. um, I like the V8 Bentleys better personally. But um, but I'm stoked because I think it's going to, I mean, it's particularly if you eliminate the turbos, mm -hmm. now you have now you can really craft an exhaust that's unmuffled. I bet it's, I bet it'll be crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's going mean, to be, it's going to be crazy. And Mate's, you know, his priorities are in order. I mean, I asked that guy, you know, what his dream cars were, and he's talking about Carrera GT, F50. I mean, he, you know, he he's he's into drivers' cars. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And he's, you know, it's, it's he, he likes he likes to drive. He is a very good driver as well, and and also he he sometimes quite often he's a lead-footed driver, so he likes to go fast. He likes to explore the limits, and he can drive the car in the limit as well. So. Mm. You know, that makes a really good case for us because he understands cars and he, it's his passion. Like, you know, it's, it, it, he does it whenever he can do it. Um, like, you can have a CEO of the company that's a very good, you know, economist or whatever. If he doesn't understand cars, it's very difficult, mm -hmm. especially if he likes to fiddle with everybody's job, which seems to be the case, you know. I always say, like, if you employ experts, there's a reason why you employ that guy. Don't mess with his work. Mm -hmm. Leave him be. Mm -hmm. You know, with some some companies, you know, everybody wants to like everybody has an opinion, of course. And whoever jumped in the Nevera and jumped out started having like you know they gave their opinion about the car. I don't mind. On the other side, like I take everybody's opinion, but I do value, you know, some guys that are really experts in the job. I do want to hear what they have to say because mm -hmm. that ticks my box. 
this is job. This is important. And I, it's important for me to know what customers say and how they perceive the car because ultimately we're doing the car for the customers. But also I want to know like how how really how good the, of a job did we do when, you know, guys that really know their stuff sit in a car and sure. drive it. It's important stuff. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, do we have some stuff on the Patreon? Let's go to that. If you want to ask questions of our guests, catch the live stream, get the show early, or have an ad-free listening experience, it's patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. Get in the game. Um, you can also directly support us, by the way. That's a that's a thing you can do. We don't have to we don't have to make YouTube the intermediary of our financial relationship. You can just give us the money directly. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chappie says, have you you ever had a very sketchy moment with a wealthy customer riding shotgun? No. <laughs> no of course, I no. of course I have. It's but probably I'm... sketchier with journalists <laughs> driving than with customers riding shotgun. There, there have been some sketchy drivers uh, with me on the passenger seat, but um, it's a game where you need to control the game. Mm. You need to be more of a psychologist than anything else, mm -hmm. and you need to be on top of the game because otherwise, you know, there's always people that think they or they know how they know how to drive actually they are you know quite inexperienced and if you let them loose if you don't catch that from the from the get go you know it, you're in trouble yeah but you know with with the experience I, I mean you can you can do it as well like you've been driven with a lot of lot of people you sit in the car with somebody he starts driving and in 5 in, seconds you know if this is going to be a bad day yes, yeah of yeah there's yeah. Re rarely a situation where somebody pleasantly surprises you if you <laughs> noticed in f you know first first 5 seconds this guy's uh, you know yeah, 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 a liability yeah. there's a I, you know on press <coughs> launches we have to share cars with people oh yeah and there is <laughs> been there there is a <laughs> there is a short list of people that I will share a car with yeah not situation where you where you get to the hotel and you see your body's like, hey, yeah. you, know, you grab him and like, we're Hundred, going together with the car. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, good. when I when I land and I'm in the shuttle to the hotel and I'm I'm like texting the PR guy like, hey yeah. man, put me in a car with uh, with this dude and not with these three people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Derek, I think we already covered his question. Uh, the, the zero to three hundred. Uh, Tim, good question. Does driving a Navara extensively warp your perception of speed when you drive internal combustion engine? cars does it make every other car feel slow yes yeah um we've done um we've done some some drives also on the tracks where just after the nevera i would jump in another car and uh there was a situation in the Nürburgring. i was using my friend's uh car and you know we've done development laps with the nevera the guys take the car to, to to charge and to change tires and i jump in this car to to give engineers a couple of laps because when we were doing the development it's very difficult for them just looking at the data to get the perception so I go okay jump with me in the car we're gonna do a lap just for you to understand what does 745 look like mm -hmm. let alone 705 right um, we jump in the car I start driving and I'm pinned to the floor in a 500 horsepower car and I feel like there's no engine yeah. well, the guy inside me is going like you know, <laughs> yeah. his eyes are like this because he doesn't know the track and stuff like that so yeah. it's, it does change your perspective quite a bit and I can I, I remember first time I, I got that feeling was when we were doing the the car for Pike's Peak so for Nobuhiro mm -hmm. uh, Tajima the, the monster Tajima we we're doing a, a 1500 horsepower electric car 365 slicks you know all around and we did development laps on the racetracks and that night i went like that evening i went to the to, to the movies with my friends and i'm not good at math at all but we were at the counter and i was helping the the woman behind the counter count you know what what you know figure out what she needs to charge us and my friend was like, "Are you on something, dude?" It's like your guys, your your brain is going like 100 miles an hour. It's like, no, no, I'm I'm good, I'm good, I'm okay. We sit in movies and bam, I fall to sleep. Oh, you're just, it's just like it gets dream. your adrenaline so high, yeah, yeah. You, it changes your perspective that everything else just feels slow. That's. Do you think? I mean, do you think that's a dangerous place for us to be as like a car buying society? I mean, not everyone is yeah. spending Nevera money. Very few people are, mm -hmm. but but. You know, you can go out there right now and and lease a thousand horsepower Tesla that'll run a nine second quarter mile yeah. for, you know, regular people money. 
um, or a Hellcat or, or whatever, but particularly with electric cars, it's much more easy to make that level of power and that level of performance, generally, industry-wide. I'm not saying it's mm-hmm. easy, but it's certainly easier to have a 1,000-horsepower electric car than a 1,000-horsepower yeah. gasoline car. But is that is that a slippery slope where people are going to start getting used to this level of performance and we, we can never go back? Um, I don't think so. I mean, if, if, if we are looking at it from a from a very vague perspective, yes, because you can, you know, once you once you try something that's really powerful, coming back to something else, you know, it's, you, you know how this looked like, and you perceive this differently. Somebody who has been driving a hundred horsepower car, or well, you put it in, put him in an Avera, it's, it's warp speed, of course. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, human body is fascinating, and what you what what I've went through with with you know with with my experience is that we get adjusted to things very quickly and you can find fun stuff in other stuff like in in, in other cars very quickly so it doesn't it's not just the power it's not just the acceleration numbers you know it's what we talked about earlier it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be a 500 horsepower car or 2000 horsepower car to be fun you know BRZ and yeah, it has yeah. 200 horsepower car on Michelin tires, like on on on, uh, on previous tires. It's super fun to drive. So it's it's about fun driving, and this is why, for example, I don't particularly like the war of numbers. I do think that we need, as you know, as a as a populate as a as a human um, evolution, we do need 2,000 horsepower car because we are pushing the boundaries, and you cannot stop progress. Mm-hmm. And it's giving us a lot of benefits. Like, you know, in, in terms of tires, we're pushing the tire developers to, to make, you know, better and safer tires. We're pushing the aerodynamics. You're, you're starting to, to um, develop the whole new ball game. And this is also how, how things were developed before. So um, what was the question before? That was it. <laughs> well, it actually goes right, it goes right into your, to your next, yeah. to my next question. I'm going to skip Michaels for a minute. Josh says, which will come first, in your opinion? Uh, peak tire technology yeah. that can no longer handle these enormous power numbers, mm-hmm. peak power technology, or what the limit of the human body can take as far as G-forces? We are already at the peak tire uh, technology. Yeah. And um, the limiting factor for, for us, especially, for for example, in Nürburgring, is you, know, you overheat the tire because you bring so much energy into the tire. You, you need to understand this. It's not just the weight. Of course, the weight plays a big role, but it's performance, what, you, you're, what you're putting down to the tire. Because mm-hmm. with a very powerful car, every single time you go on the power, you are on the tire limit. You are pushing, you know, you're, you're asking, you're demanding a lot from the tire. And it's very difficult for the tires to keep up with the temperature uh, and also to keep up with the speed and the weight that you're putting into the tire. We, when we were doing the the, the record, the, the 400 kilometer an hour record, I remember talking to a Michelin uh, engineer. He was like, we had a, an oval, which is like you have two lanes of four and a half kilometers and then you have the oval mm-hmm. connecting it. So that oval is like 50 degrees or something like that. It's like humongous. That's a, big, wow. that's a you, steep yeah, you, you, when, when I When I wanted to park the car there to take photos, I didn't want to park it in the top lane because it just feels like the car is going to roll, yeah. roll down. So it's 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 super uh, super steep, and the guy said like keep I think to Talladega is thirty three degrees, and that's yeah. our steepest banking in America. So this yeah. is fifty. You cannot yeah, walk that's, up. That's like a wall. Yeah, you cannot walk up. That's crazy. So um, we we were doing that. The guy said like two hundred kph, keep it in the lowest uh, lanes, and then you know go to the straight and gun it. And I was doing that corner and. I was looking at my my, my uh, reference points, and as I was looking at the reference points, my foot like moved ever so slightly. And when the car went on the straight, I looked at the speedo. I was like 260, 270 already. I was like, okay, <laughs> that was not supposed to happen, but yeah. okay. And we we were that was the the early phase of development. So we were we were going like with increments of speed up and up and up every every run. And I asked the guy from Michelin, it's like. You know how on the limit are we? Like if I if I go a little bit quicker, is it a problem? Uh, well, you know how quick did you did you go? I was like 260. Okay, let's look at the telemetry data. And it's like so you had 1.5 g pushing you down of the centrifugal force. Mm-hmm. 
And I went like, yeah, but it, it all felt fine. It's like, of course it felt fine. Yeah. You had you that's know, how banked tracks work. Yeah, <laughs> and it was it was really you know tired tired developers or like manufacturers. Of course they need to have a limit mm -hmm. because we are idiots and yeah. we push the boundaries. And if they go like you can go 2.8 par, they know we're gonna to go 2.6 bar because you know drivers always want to have more traction. Right. But if they give you 2.6 and it's already at the limit, yeah, and you yeah. go 2.4 and you have a tire blowout, it's a mess. Like it's a huge, huge safety issue, mm -hmm. even during testing. Um, and I know that some of the drivers on Nurburgring, you know, th they they have their own tire gauges and they do their own tire pressures, <laughs> yeah. which is very risky. So um, tire manufacturers are really, really trying to push the boundaries and really trying to do, to give us the tire that's going to be safe enough that you can, to, you know, you need to, you need to play. Yeah, but at a certain point, it's just, it's just too much. I mean, it's just. Yeah. I mean, for example, Aston Martin makes the Valkyrie, yeah. the, the AMR Pro and the streetcar. Yeah. And one of their people said, you know, off the record, really, to me, and it's, and I'm not, I'm, off the record means I'm not saying who told me, but someone said, like, you know, the, 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 the streetcar one, yeah. you really don't want to bring that to like a track day. It's really not meant because the car can overwhelm the street tires yeah. very, very easily. Mm -hmm. And you end up with either no grip or like, you know, a tire blowout or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you really are going to go take this thing to racetracks, you, you really want to get the race car version, which is yeah. optimized for, for slick tires. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I know that, that people listen to what manufacturers are saying and 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 uh, numbers of times I, i've had the experience where they are neglecting that and they go like oh we're not gonna go fast or whatever yeah. it's not a joke like the, the the development is of course the manufacturers have a safety margin which is quite big mm -hmm. but um it's not a joke it's not the same like people ask us like why don't you just have the car at 412 kph for the for the customers it's not as easy because we need to ensure that your tires are okay, that yeah. your alignment is okay, that the car is okay, that you have a, a clear track with no debris and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, having a tire, like if you if you blow out the rear tire, it's not like you're gonna just stop, that's <laughs> it. The car is gonna pitch, you're gonna have air you know, hitting the, the underfloor of the car, the car can be airborne. So yeah. it's, a, it's a really a messy situation or or on, 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 you know, on uh, track days and stuff like that. So. I would say to people like you know, don't take those those inputs from the manufacturer lightly. You know, don't don't be don't try to be your own engineer. Yeah. You know, there's teams that do top speeds at you know very high rate and high high levels. I don't know how they are experienced, but I'm not sure they are aware, you know, what they are playing with. That actually leads to Michael's question: Have you ever been assigned a task that was too risky to complete? Or if not, is there anything you are happy to survive that you, you'll never do again? <laughs> um, so um, from that perspective, as a professional test driver, as a professional driver, you're always um, expected to do the risk assessment and risk management. This is why somebody hires you. Mm -hmm. um, this is why we hire professional drivers, just to know like, okay, we don't go above that limit. But there were stuff that we did that were super sketchy. As journalists, or not as a as, test driver. Oh, okay. Um, we did a record run in reverse. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Two seventy-five kilometers an hour. Not in awesome. reverse. Fuck in that. reverse. That's <laughs> yeah. real shady. Yeah. So I was doing the development for that, and it was um, we had a bunch of stuff to do, and it was the last day of testing. And it was also, you know, it, it started to become dark and we had the software to test this. And we said, okay, we're not gonna do that record run now, but we need to test the software. Mm -hmm. And it's better to ditch it because, you know, it's getting dark and all these things. And I was like, no, 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 let's do it now. Let's let's test this, let's go. And I remember sitting in a car going to the, the, to the track and I thinking, I'm thinking to myself like, you are breaking every single rule in your head that you said you're never going to do. You never do one more run and then we go home. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. First thing. Second thing, it's getting dark. Your reference points are getting smaller. Yeah. You didn't think this through. You didn't like imagine it in your head how it's going to look like. Yeah. You're just winging this and you're going at high speed. 
In reverse. In reverse. So Speaking first, of wings, the wings are optimized for the car to go forwards, not backwards. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. so we did it in cold weather, you know, so well below the, where the tire op- optimum tire temperature should be. And I hope my wife is not looking at this and watch this. <laughs> but we did it. We did very sketchy stuff. And uh, I remember I did like three runs. We got to like 200 kph, which which was well over the the record. And it's like, okay, we put this, you know, in the in the bag. Yeah. And next time we do it, I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, it was it was really that was that was really you know, that's something that you know it's an engineering project nevertheless, but it's just you know, yeah. Malarkey. We did that once in a gas car for a television show, mm-hmm. really fast in reverse, and we overheated the car. Yeah, that didn't have any airflow over yeah, the radiator, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it didn't take long. Yeah. I mean, it was it was it was maybe a minute, and we overheated the car. The sketchiest surprised. stuff is not going in reverse. People think it is, but if you if you keep your steering straight and if you keep the balance of the car straight, it's okay. Yeah, the sketchy stuff is braking, because when you go on the brakes, you have your brake bias yeah. basically like a handbrake. Yeah. So you're looking for front. You're not looking in reverse. You're looking front, and you're looking at the horizon. Mm-hmm. And as soon as it starts moving, you need to do. A, a correction and mm-hmm. there's basically not a lot that you can do so as soon as you start you, you see something going 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 sketchy you basically you, you slow down you ditch that run yeah and when you start braking when you need to stop the car and you're doing this in a, in a straight line and then it winds up widens up on a dynamic platform where you have a lot of room so when you start braking you start braking and when you feel the front starting to be light what you do is you do a j-turn so you flip the car <laughs> and then you, you have brakes turn forward. it wow. and then you brake with the car <laughs> going straight that's sketchy that that's counts. awesome that that's, that's incredible yeah is there anything else zach no that was it okay that yeah that cool. yeah that sounds sketchy i don't yeah. i don't like that no thanks no no <laughs> i'm surprised you didn't overheat the car actually yeah it was it was surprisingly good because like well, those cars that car needs cooling too yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, does. it does well then you remote's Set the record again. They went 171 in reverse miles per hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was, but that was not you. That, it was, that was not me. Yeah, no, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying, like yeah. the car can go even faster, and it did without overheating. And I imagine customer cars cannot do that. No, no, no. no. Yeah, <laughs> limited, limited to they're, twelve. They're, they're limited to a lower, yeah, ba- much lower number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for coming in, Miro. Thank Always you good to see yeah. you. Are you? Uh, uh, I, I will. I will send you my recommendations for the next uh, test route, which I'm sure they will listen to. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I really one day I'd like to come to Croatia and see how you guys are living over there. Everyone says such yeah. nice things. You, you need to come. You need to come to visit the factory and understand, you know, to, to see where the cars are being built and to see what goes into them. And now the the campus is is coming along very nicely, and mm. you know. Very soon, you'll be able to come to the campus and see how it looks. Yeah. Right now, it's it's scattered around, but it's it's really cool. It's it's ama- it's it's a really neat company, and and um, Mate is a really smart guy, and and everyone I've worked with um, at that company has been a lot of fun and, and very cool. And and uh, thank you to our patrons for asking good questions today. We appreciate it. Uh, drive safe. Thank you. Please. Always. And uh, we'll see all you guys next week. Bye.